As the legendary A-10 Warthog looks down the barrel of an uncertain future, I have seen one question pop up in the comments below my articles and videos more and more lately. Could the US field a stealth iteration of this close air support Titan for use in the contested airspaces of the 21st century? Let's dive into whether or not this would be feasible and why the A-10 may not need stealth at all to play a huge role in 21st century warfare. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. Before we dive in today, I want to take a second to highlight the incredible artwork of aviation artist Rodrigo Avella, who we featured in the thumbnail of this video and all over our original write-up for this story. You probably remember the mind-blowing illustrations Rodrigo let us use in our series about the technology we could cram into a sixth-generation fighter. But there is seriously tons of other incredible stuff all over his website and his Instagram account. It is quickly becoming one of my favorite accounts online. Now, I offered to pay Rodrigo for the use of his images for my thumbnail, and he's such a nice guy that he just wouldn't have it. So if you love aviation and you want to support a good guy, go give Rodrigo a follow on Instagram. You will not regret it. But now let's dive into the subject at hand, because make no mistake about it, the Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II, or Warthog, as many of us know it, has earned every bit of the hero worship that it's gotten over the past 22 or so years of combat operations. But as awesome as the phrase Stealth Warthog would be to see emblazoned across a new program, the truth is, the way the A-10 engages the enemy really sort of runs counter to how stealth aircraft have to operate in order to maintain a low profile in contested airspace. But that doesn't mean it's time to send this old warthog out to the farm just yet, because there's another way to keep the A-10 relevant for a 21st century fight. But first, let's talk a bit more about why a stealth A-10 may seem really cool, but wouldn't really work in the real world. You see, unlike other kinds of air support, which usually come in the form of precision-guided ordnance delivered by high-flying fast jets or fighters that don't really have the gas to stick around for long, the A-10 engages ground troops by flying directly at them at low altitude while unleashing what is, for all intents and purposes, a laser beam of depleted uranium rounds directly at its targets. In a very real way, you could compare the way the A-10 fights to a medieval knight jousting, except instead of using a lance, it uses a Gatling gun. And to really appreciate just how special the A-10 is, you need to appreciate the GAU-8 Avenger Gatling gun that the A-10 was effectively built around. From a thousand feet away, the A-10's gun is rated to put about 80% of a thousand round volley inside a five meter circle. But here's the mind boggling part. The A-10's gun cycles through these 10 and a half inch long rounds at an astonishing 70 rounds per second. Do you see what I mean about it effectively being a depleted uranium laser beam? But as cool as that is, there's always a but. And in the case of the A-10, that but is that in order for these pilots to put rounds on target, they have to be willing to eat quite a bit of enemy fire in the process. The Warthog's 58-foot wingspan provides a pretty ample target for anti-aircraft guns and even small arms fire, thanks to the low altitudes they tend to operate at. Now, the A-10 we have today tends to shrug that off, thanks in no small part to the titanium tub that its pilots nestle in when they're behind the stick. But the bag of meat in the cockpit isn't the only thing to get the armored treatment. Other essential systems all throughout the aircraft got similar titanium armor, and the jet itself was designed with a bunch of redundancies to help make sure it could keep operating when flying against Soviet convoys that would have included radar-guided anti-aircraft guns that would very likely find their low-flying targets as the Warthog zoomed in. The result of this armor and system resiliency is that it's not even weird to see A-10s fly home and even land safely after racking up some serious damage in the fight. When looking for stories about how tough the A-10 is, one doesn't have to look very far 
One of my all-time favorites comes from 2003, when then-Captain Kim Campbell flew her A-10 home after it took such heavy damage that it lost all hydraulic power. Now, if you're not aware, the hydraulic systems are what you use to actually control the aircraft. She not only flew all the way home, but executed a pretty much perfect landing using the backup system, which is literally just cranks and cables. The A-10 is a seriously tough airplane. These kinds of incredible stories shine a light on how tough the A-10 is, how heroic the pilots who operate them are, and also why the Warthog doesn't really operate in a way that's conducive to stealth. I mean, the truth is the A-10 is really sort of the polar opposite of a stealth aircraft. It's designed to operate in uncontested airspace, where it can focus all its fury on ground targets. We have another video talking about how the A-10 really can hold its own in a dogfight if it's forced to, but no A-10 pilot really hopes to put that to the test. They would much prefer to leave that to air superiority champs like the F-15 or F-22. The Warthog has no onboard radar for air-to-air -air combat, but does carry AIM-9 infrared-seeking air-to-air missiles that it can leverage against airborne targets if they're beyond the reach of the Warthog's world-famous. There's no doubt about it, the A-10 Thunderbolt II is an incredible aircraft capable of taking a serious beating and dishing it out twice as well. But when operating inside contested airspace, making your presence clearly known to the enemy, flying directly at your opponents at low altitude, and eating a bunch of small arms fire along the way, are all things a stealth jet just can't do if it wants to stay stealthy enough to make it all the way back home. Modern stealth fighter designs really go a long way toward deflecting radar waves away from the aircraft, but jets like the F-22 and F-35 are still really reliant on a coating of radar absorbent materials, or RAM, that covers the majority of the airframe and is layered over gaps or crevices in the airplane's body. Even the tiniest gap between body panels on a jet can result in producing a larger radar signature, so you'll often see seams covered in RAM tape. Stealth aircraft keep their engines tucked inside their body, but you'll see a thick layer of RAM around the jet inlets because that's a trouble spot for radar returns. You'll also see thicker RAM on the leading edge of the wings as well as on vertical tail surfaces because all of these things are apt to produce a radar return. Now, modern RAM is really a miracle worker. It's rated to absorb upwards of 70 to 80 percent of inbound electromagnetic energy, or radar waves, and that makes it really useful for stealth applications. But, and by now you probably realize there's always a but, RAM is extremely fragile and extremely expensive to maintain. In fact, scraping off damaged RAM coatings and reapplying new RAM paint is one of the bigger expenses associated with maintaining America's fleets of F-22s and F-35s. Now imagine covering an A-10 in this extremely expensive material and sending it back into the shredder that is just normal A-10 operations. That titanium tub would still protect its occupants and the systems on board, but every time the aircraft took fire, whole portions of its airframe would have to have its RAM completely removed and then completely replaced. That would very quickly make the currently inexpensive to operate A-10 one of the more expensive aircraft in Uncle Sam's hangars. But believe it or not, RAM doesn't even come close to being the most expensive part of trying to make the A-10 stealthy because the aircraft's design itself would have to fundamentally change, and that would cost so much money that you'd be better off just building a whole new jet instead. You see, the A-10's design was largely finalized by 1972, which is around 11 years before the world's first stealth aircraft, the F-117 Nighthawk, secretly entered service. In other words, the Warthog's design is from a pre-stealth era, and bringing it up to snuff would require a lot more than a facelift. It would need an entire design overhaul. The eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that stealth jets like the F-35 don't have giant hydraulically driven seven-barrel Gatling guns sticking out of their noses. That is, in part, of course, due to the fact that the A-10's Avenger cannon is about the size of an entire Volkswagen Beetle. But it's also because having a big cannon sticking out of the nose of your jet can really wreak havoc on your stealth profile. 
Our favorite artist, Rodrigo Avella, seemed to hear this criticism coming, because he even prepared a full series of images of his A14 concept that don't leverage a big gun up front. He's dubbed this the A14B. But unfortunately, the gun isn't the end of the trouble, because on the opposite end of the A10, its two high-mounted General Electric TF-34 GE100A turbofan engines are another big problem for limiting both its radar and its infrared returns. In fact, just about every facet of the A-10 airframe would have to be redesigned in order to mitigate detection. And sort of like that Ship of Theseus paradox that was recently referenced in Marvel's WandaVision, there comes a point when replacing every external component that you have to ask yourself, are we even still building the same aircraft? The truth is, it would be more cost-effective to scrap the A-10 and start over on a new AX platform that combines a low-observable design with some heavy-hitting weaponry. But even if that were the case, if you wanted to equip it with the big Avenger cannon, you'd be facing the same problems we already discussed. The fact of the matter is, building a stealth aircraft just to mount a huge cannon on it and fly it straight into enemy gunfire just isn't a very cost-effective solution. But that's obviously not the end of the A-10 story. It's expected to keep flying well into the 2040s, stealth be damned. So that begs the question, if a near-peer fight were to kick off, how could the A-10 help America win that fight without sending a bunch of its pilots to an early grave? The answer may not be a popular one, but it really seems to be moving away from relying on the aircraft's reputation-defining cannon and instead using the A-10 to flood the airspace with highly capable long-range weapons and decoys anytime the A-10 needs to get up close and personal with the bad guy. In a fantastic piece penned by A-10 weapons officer Major Maurice Spawn Grosso for Task and Purpose, Spawn breaks down how integrated standoff weapons, or SOWs, on the A-10 could offer commanders in theater a valuable uptick in ordnance on target. According to his assessment, the A-10 could feasibly carry four or even five AGM-158 Joint Air-to-Surface Standoff Missiles, or JASMs. Now, to date, the only other fighter in American hangars that can do that is the F-15E Strike Eagle, which has room for five JASMs on board. The furthest reaching iteration of these air-launched cruise missiles has a reported range in excess of 1,100 miles, meaning an A-10 could launch these missiles from well outside the reach of enemy air defenses. Now, I won't go through all of it here, but in my full write-up on this topic, I go over the cost per launch in different types of aircraft for these missiles, and suffice to say, launching them from the A-10 would represent about $10,000 in savings per missile launch. But to be honest, that's not even where the A-10 could really prove its value in a 21st century fight. The Warthog could be incredibly valuable for deploying a high volume of ADM-160, Miniature Air-Launched Decoys, or MALD systems. Now, the MALD isn't a weapon, exactly. It's an ingenious little air-launched flight vehicle developed by Raytheon that perfectly mimics the radar signatures of any aircraft in American or Allied arsenals. These relatively inexpensive decoys have a range of about 500 miles, and they can currently be launched by both F-16s and the B-52. When employed in large volume, they can saturate enemy airspace with enough spoofed radar signatures to make it really tough, if not impossible, for air defense systems to find real targets. The more advanced mauled J also offers radar jamming capabilities, which further complicates matters for surface-to-air missile batteries trying to lock on to an aircraft. At only around 300 pounds per decoy, the F-16 can currently deliver as many as four MALDs into the fight. The massive B-52, on the other hand, can deliver as many as 16. And this is where the A-10 can really shine. Because according to Spawn, tests have showed that the A-10's triple ejector racks can each carry two mauled decoys, meaning a single A-10 could carry the same 16 mauled decoys as a B-52 Stratofortress. Now, aside from the fact that that means a four-ship formation of A-10s could put 64 mauled decoys into enemy airspace, you also really need to know that the B-52, which carries the same number of decoys, costs about $70,000 an hour to fly, whereas the A-10 only costs about 20. The truth is, 
Stealth is incredibly valuable in a fight, but it isn't everything. The A-10 could potentially be used to deploy a huge volume of decoys into enemy airspace, which could make it significantly safer for fourth-generation jets to operate. It could also deploy long-range standoff munitions that would keep it out of contested airspace altogether. The Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt II may be a dated design that was built for a fight that never came. But the fact of the matter is, this incredibly capable, resilient, and cost-effective aircraft could still play a very valuable role in a near-peer conflict. We just have to be willing to use it the right way. And on that ends yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.